people can just join us. Well, welcome everyone. This is the Pasadena Village presentation of the 1619, the Lingering Imprint discussion group. We talk about race and, and lots of discrimination issues and other things of interest. Uh, in this is the middle. We're in the middle of Black History Month. Last uh, uh, last presentation on the first Friday of the month, we had Larry Dupliton tell us tell us about the Black experience in the film industry. Today, we're going to have Ricky Pickens talk to us about gang violence and where he works with gang violence, trying to suppress gang violence and lead our young people in the right direction. And then next uh, month, at the beginning of the month, we're going to call it February Plus a little bit because we have another in, uh, interesting presentation kind of connected to Black History Month. We got Helene Rheingold is returning with another one of her conversations with Art. And those are always entertaining and engaging. We hope that people will show up there. So today we're back to working with gang violence and Ricky Pickens, our special guest. I'm just going to turn it over to Ricky and let him take it from there. He can tell you a little bit about his black guy and experience and, and how he wants to conduct the presentation. And we'll take it from there. So Ricky, go ahead. And by the way, we're being recorded. Everybody should know that. So, all right, take it away, Ricky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dick. Before I get into the, the presentation itself, I'm let me first of all say thank you to the Pasadena Village for this invitation to speak to this group. Uh, as people in the community learned that I was going to be speaking to this group, I, someone asked me, uh, why would you choose a uh, the Pasadena Village in, in terms of an elderly network? And I told them when it comes to, to gang violence, prevention and intervention, uh, everyone is included in that in the community. Our, our seniors make up our community. And so even though that... Um, people look at gangs and, and things that it's exclusive to uh, one culture or one group of people. That's not right because violence impacts us all. And so regardless what neighborhood we live in or what block, uh, if you live in that city, it has an impact on every last one of us. So I really appreciate Pasadena's, uh, Pasadena Village interest in, uh, in our efforts, in our work. And so um, I'm going to hop into, I'm going to talk really quick about myself. I don't like doing that part, but I want to give you some context on how uh, I do this work. Uh, so I've been doing this work since 1999. Uh, 2004 is when I call the city platform because I was hired by the Pasadena Police Department to, to be their gang outreach specialist. And what that entailed was, is that they were at that time, um, Pasadena had a, a real increase in gangs and gang violence in the early 2000s. And so at that time, uh, the then chief Bernard Malikian uh, was innovative and brought in a gang specialist to help with the gang problem in the city. Because one of the things that chief Malikian realized early on, especially after the 1997 shootings, is that the Pasadena Police Department could not arrest their way out of this, this type of uh, behavior. And so uh, me being born and raised in Pasadena, uh, he invited me in. And the first thing that I did is I brought gang members and police officers together in the same room. And you're talking about oil and water. and You're talking about cutting the atmosphere with a knife. And it was and at the time that I brought them together. Let me paint this picture for you all. At the time that I brought them together, just the night before, there was a gang shooting. There were two, to be exact. And uh, the police was looking for the shooter. So they brought out a bloodhound. And when they brought the bloodhound out, the bloodhound led them to a garage that was probably about two blocks away. And in that carport in that garage were a bunch of alleged gang members. And so the police came in with guns blazing. Well, two days later, Ricky Pickens got those same police officers and those guys that was in that carport in the same room having a discussion about what's what happened and what's going on. And when I tell you that room was thick, that room was thick. And so, uh, but we came out of there and everybody had one common thing. And that was, is that the police have a job to do and the gang members are doing what they do. And the only thing the guys ask is that in the, in the middle of the cat and mouse game that uh, everyone keeps their dignity and everyone's safe. And so that's how we walked away. And so since then I've been going and I've been creating youth programs and gang intervention programs within the city of Pasadena, outside the city of Pasadena on a national level. I'm a national a gang trainer and facilitator. And so now here we are two decades later and, uh, and I'm back again. And what brought me up to this point, just to give you a little background, we can go to the first slide if we can, to give you a little background so you can understand how, how we got to this day. 
is that uh, in 2020, um, next slide, so they can see the background, the background slide. Um, one more time. I'm just going to hop into it. We'll get cover the agenda. So in 2020, uh, the city of Pasadena experienced a significant increase in gang-related shootings. Uh, right at the end of 2020 there, we had actually a shooting December 26, uh, 2020, and there was a shooting uh, the day before on Christmas Day. And so then uh, former city manager Steve Rommel gave me a call who he I had history with, and he gave me a call and said, hey, Ricky, we have an uptick in violence here, and, and we want to know if there's anything that you can do to give us a hand. Well, that was somewhat of a challenge because Ricky Pickens no longer lives in the city of Pasadena. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so the first thing that I, I shared with Mr. Mermel is, is, hey, I can do it. And I have a ton of people there. I have a whole team there that can help me do it. Uh, but you got to allow me to bring my team on board. And so here we are today. He allowed me to bring my team on board uh, back then. But some of the other things that they put in place was uh, they began to increase law enforcement presence. Uh, they all, actually, throughout the next couple of years, they installed the, the, the cameras within city parks and public places around the city. Uh, we all learned the shot spotter technology. And then the most important thing is they continued our services, which is the gang, out, gang outreach, violence, and interruption team. They continued our services. And so that allowed us to continue to work uh, behind the scenes. And we say behind the scenes because a lot of our work is really dealing with those that are influencers within the gang culture, those that are either directly involved in the violence, those are those that are directly um, uh, behind the scenes navigating some of the violence, are those that may be uh, uh, centered around the violence. So we started really getting busy doing that and to help in the first order of business was to stop the shootings. We can go to the next slide. And so I'm gonna talk about briefly uh and i can't see hands and i can't see on here so if you let me say this and while i'm pre presenting this if you have a question just make sure you guys ask your questions while we go along because i'll move along and start giving out information and i won't say now i don't want you to lose your train of thought there um so as we begin this work one of the things we did is we worked directly at the street level so when i say at the street level i'm talking about garages i'm talking about parks i'm talking about anywhere where we believe that there's some gang involvement or where there we believe that there can be some uh, some people that are engaged in gang violence and so we do that not only in pasadena but we do it in surrounding cities that that can impact pasadena such as monrovia Duarte, or other cities that may have pasadena ties such as lancaster palmdale san bernardino so we will go all over within those regions in order to interrupt violence, to mediate conflicts that will lead to violence back to Pasadena, or to even uh, to, to provide resources to this same population of people to hopefully dissuade them from violent behavior or to actually get them to leave the gang lifestyle. And so uh, we do that a number of different ways. Uh, we do that through peer-to-peer -peer counseling. We do that through mentoring. We do that through uh, mediations, anything that we can do to interrupt a potential shooting, to interrupt a potential violent behavior, or to hopefully uh, dissuade somebody to leave the gang lifestyle through the resources that they're provided. And let me stop right there and, 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 and tell you about some of the resources or tell you to some of the barriers that will, and this is not on the slide so that you guys are getting this exclusive, um, some of the barriers to, to people leaving the gang life. One of the barriers is always employ, employment. Uh, many of those engaged in gang violence, not all, I won't say all, uh, but I will say many have either um, interrupted their schooling or at, at some point in time created a record for themselves where employment becomes a big barrier because of background or because lack of experience or lack of uh, lack of education. So that's the first thing. And uh, I think uh, Father Greg Boyle at Homeway Industries he coined the phrase, the, this phrase the best uh, in LA. He says, nothing stops a bullet like a job. And so one of the things that we try to focus on for the young adults and the adults, because gang members we work with uh, start from the age of 10 years old up to the age of 60, 65 years old, believe it or not. And so when you get you start getting into that um, marketable employment range, we try to, we, we do our best to, to help you gain some gainful employment so that hopefully that you're busy for eight to 10 hours of the day where there's no room for 
for game behavior. So the other barriers include things like child support, where people don't know how to navigate the, the CPS system or the child support system, uh, because uh, what happens is they, they, get in, they get incarcerated, and then when they get incarcerated, uh, they, they get behind on their child support, then they come home in the back payments. And so what they the system does is they take their license from them. So if you can't have a driver's license, you can't get to work. And then those barriers, it becomes a trickle down effect. And so we're not having a driver's license and so on and so forth, or therefore their wages are getting docked. And so it discourages them from, from continuing work because they don't know how to uh, navigate the system and talking with social workers and things like that. So these are all things that we are, we're not just interrupting violence, but we're, we're doing a, a, a low case management work as well as social workers when we're working with this population. And so let me talk real quickly about my team. So each member of our, my team, uh, each one of them are former, former gang members or have a, a gang background. And so um, many of them have already been arrested. Many of them have served prison time. Many of them have what we call in, in our community a license to operate. And a license to operate is what the gang members that's in the community allow them to talk to them and give them trust to talk to them or come in the community because of their background and because of their influence in order to either help them or to help mediate conflicts. And so every last one of my team members uh, falls somewhere in that category and, and they do that. Um, and that's the way that they approach you know, the gang, gang intervention. So the team utilizes their personal relationships uh, to anticipate or interrupt gang violence. And then not just mediating conflicts, but also they do referrals. And we refer everything from housing to substance abuse, to um, mental health treatment, to um, anything that, that, that involves where it would help someone to leave the gang lifestyle. Now, that's what we do during the intervention side of it. When we're not intervening in violence, we're doing prevention. You can go to the next slide. So this is what we're doing when we're not intervening in violence. So we have prevention, intervention, and referral. And I'll talk quickly about prevention because prevention is, consists of a couple of things. Uh, one is with youth because we're trying to dissuade youth from, from joining gangs. But prevention is also when we intervene in, a, in an act of violence that prevents the next act of violence, because here's what I mean by that. In the gang world, whenever there's a shooting or there's an act of violence, uh, there's something that we that gang members live by, and that's called retaliation. So if you do something to me, I have to do something to you. If you, you shoot at me, I got to shoot at you. And so these things happen. And so when we intervene in a retaliation, meaning that there's a shooting, and then there's not a retali retaliatory shooting, then we've prevented the next act of violence through our intervention efforts. So there's, our prevention is kind of two prong. It's not only just deals with youth and preventing them from going down that, that road of cycle of violence, but we also intervene and we use that as a prevention tool to prevent the, ne act, the next act of violence. And that's really where a lot of the crutch or the success of our work uh, lies at is in the retaliation portion because we can't prevent every act of shooting but once we learn of a shooting or a violent act, what we can do is begin to learn what was the what was at the center of that and hopefully find the people who are around the center of that and, and mediate the conflict so that there's not another act of violence. So that's that's how we work in the prevention world. And in the intervention world is just what what the way it is, is we, we intervene with those who are already there. You know, they're already in the gang lifestyle. They've been at it for a while. Each. I, I, I want to say this, that believe it or not, each person that's in gangs are not in gangs for the same reason. Some, it, you know, oftentimes when we talk to uh, people that's involved in the, in the gangs world, many of them had desires to, to be police officers and firefighters and, and uh, other careers. Uh, but circumstances, situation, whether it's neighborhood environment or whether it's uh, some type of retaliatory thing that happened, uh, led them down a different path. I'll pause just because I know I'm moving kind of quickly here, but I want to give you guys a quick story. So this is a quick treat for you. Um, there, I'll share the story of two young men who are, and this is a true story, two young men who were both uh, cousins living in the same house and living in a gang impacted area. And in this area uh, with their, where they're living at, their cousins, brothers, friends, all those people were involved in, in the gang lifestyle. 
these two young men made a decision that they, they wasn't going to do it, but they were in the custody of their grandmother. And so they went to school together each day, every day. Uh, the mother and father both were in the lifestyle. Well, uh, one of the grandmother's kids decided to get herself together. She, she, she gets off drugs and get out of the life and she moves away to San Bernardino. And when she moves away to San Bernardino, she takes one of, she takes her son. The other son is the cousin of, of, of the one that I'm talking about. And so one is now remaining in the city. The other one is living in San Bernardino. Both of them had desires. One had a desire to be a firefighter. The other had a desire to be a police officer. They were well on their way. Both of them very successful, making straight A's and B's in school. And then one day, one of the guys who were living, the guy that was living in San Bernardino, he moved, uh, he went, he was coming home from school and he stopped at a local store. And when he stopped at the store, he was caught in a drive-by shooting. And so he was shot and killed. The kid that was back at home in the city, he learned of his cousin who, who now he looked at as his brother had passed away from, from this, this incident. Well, his desires changed. He no longer wanted to be a firefighter. He grew up and later became a gang member. And he became a gang member, not because that was his initial thought. His initial thing was to be a firefighter, but he became a gang member because he wanted to retaliate against the gang that killed his cousin. And so now he started down that road and became a rival gang member of the, the person that killed his cousin, of the gang that killed his cousin. And so that's how his gang journey began. Now, was that his original intent? Absolutely not. But circumstances caused him to be there. And so those are the things that we try to get out in front of. And those we try to build relationship with youth early on uh, that hopefully that when those kind of circumstances happen, that they meet someone of myself or on my team, that when tragedy happens or they get caught in that kind of situation, that they can turn to one of us and versus turn into the, the neighborhood or turn into the street. And although we may not have been able to prevent that, we may have been able to catch that young person and talk them out of it and hopefully navigate them throughout the system in a different way where they learn they don't they don't become, you know, the next person in, engaged in the gang life. And then in, in part of our uh, interaction with young people, one of the things we do is we don't necessarily uh, dispel and talk, uh, degrade the gangs. What we do is we talk about some of the consequences that that's involved in the gang life. But we also talk about some of the, the other things that they learn, like loyalty and respect and things like that, and how they can translate that into the civilized world versus in that kind of culture. And so there, there are those things that we talk about as well. Let me talk about uh, the slide that you're looking at now, the prevention and intervention. So the way that we do that is in the prevention side, we identify early and address the uh, opportunist, opportunistic factors uh, that influence youth and young adults. What are those things? Um, money, lack of money, dysfunctional homes, um, living in a gang impacted neighborhood or an environment, all the, some of the things that lure kids in the gang. So we, when we're doing our outreach and our canvassing in neighborhoods, we try to find young people who are hanging out in the park during school hours who are not uh, attending class or who are showing a, a disruptive behavior or that maybe a parent or a guardian will uh, uh, let us know that, you know, their, their, their kid is doing graffiti or however, we do our best to, to get out in front and develop relationships with young people so that they can have an outlet versus having an outlet in the game. And so whatever the factor is or some of the risk factors are, that young people uh, that persuade them to get into that that type of lifestyle, we do our best to hopefully discourage them and show them an alternative way uh, instead of the gang life. And then on the intervention side, we identify the highest uh, risk youth or those that are already engaged. And then again, uh, instead of trying to prevent, obviously they're already there. So we do our best to offer other alternatives such as education, job training, uh, things like that through our referral process. So we, we build relationships such as with Pasadena Village or uh, different agencies and organizations who have connections, contacts, uh, who may not can give a person a job, but they say, you know what, uh, I know this person over here and, and they'll be willing to hire you if you, you know, make it through the vetting process. Or maybe they'll be willing to hire you based off a relationship that they have with Ricky. And we trust that Ricky would would, would send you through the proper vetting process. So, so those are the things. Now, everyone in, that we interact with uh, 
it's not a one size fit all. We have to identify what is what are their barriers and make sure we're doing a proper referral process because we don't want to refer somebody to a job who has a substance abuse problem. So this is really some social work case management. It's a whole lot that it that 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 goes into this work uh, when we're doing intervention and prevention. So we have to listen to people. We have to understand their problems. Uh, sometimes we have to take people to to job interviews. Sometimes we have to sit in living rooms and, and 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 even at times, you know, because similar stories, we cry with people. I mean, whatever the circumstances are, we do our best to hopefully provide uh, some hope because that's the cure uh, in this culture. That's the cure in, in, in these type of populations. The cure for any intervention, any prevention is hope. And so that's how we move in, in that area. Next slide, please. So let me explain a little bit about how how gangs work and how these things work. And, 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 I, and I'm talking about particularly here in Pasadena, this, this kind of goes in most cities. So the big gray, if you look at the pie chart on the right, the big gray part of it, if you think about um, uh, gangs and gang members, so let's just say, and I'm going to throw out a hypothetical number here. Let's just say that there's 300 gang members in Pasadena. Hold on one second here. Let me make sure I can see this correctly. So let's just say that there's 300 gang members in Pasadena. So we have what we call gang members, gang associates. So everybody that's a gang member is not an active gang member. Everybody that's a gang associate is not out there doing violent crime. When I say active gang member, that's doing a crime or that's retaliating on behalf of the gang. And so everyone just you may see 15 let's just say hypothetically you may see 15 guys and girls hanging out on the block that that all claims to be a part of the gang all 15 guys and girls may not may or may not be gang involved or actively gang banging because there's a difference between a gang banger and a gang member a gang member a gang banger is active they're uh retaliating they're doing stuff on behalf of the gang a gang member is just associating. They're hanging out every day, but at the end of the day, they go home. At the end of the day, they're not getting arrested. At the end of the day, when, when the stuff hit the fan, they're not uh, engaged. So most of the time, there's a small group out of the gang that's really gang banging or actively moving on behalf of the gang. So if there's 300, there's maybe 30 guys throughout a community that's really actively involved. And, and, and I'm speaking particularly for Pasadena because we know some of the demographics. So if we say that there's, you know, let's just say 30 gang members in Pasadena, it's probably about three, less than, less than 10 of them doing real active gang stuff. But that's, a, that's not a small thing. That's a big problem because whether it's one or 10, what happens is, is that when there's a shooting, it impacts everyone. If, if violence breaks out and there's retaliatory shootings back and forth, it shuts down our community because now kids can't go to the park. Kids can't take advantage of the rec programs because parents and guardians are scared for their kids to get caught up in crossfire. So whether it's one, 10, 300, it impacts everyone when there's shootings going on in our, our community, in our neighborhoods. Our nonprofit organizations are paralyzed because they can't provide the service that they want to provide because our kids and our youth can't attend those programs because parents and guardians are afraid to have their kids out past a certain time or, or during after school hours. So that's important to know because even though there's a small fraction of people that, that perpetrate the violence, it still impacts a larger part of our community. And so that's important to know. So I wanted to share that with you all. And I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen hands or anything. Great. I think we're doing good. Next slide, please. This is important. This is important and something to understand because this is happening throughout the nation, particularly Los Angeles County. And this is gang crimes and trends. So a, a fact to know is that 67 percent of gang related homicides happen in cities with more than 100,000 citizens with while 17 percent occur in suburban areas. Forty nine percent of those are human trafficking victims or were connected to a gang one way or another. And then 96 of those were victims were females. And so that's important to know because 
uh, particularly within Latino gangs, uh, the human trafficking part is a big deal. Uh, and we're starting to, to see some of that even within black gangs. Uh, another fact that I did not list on here, Pasadena uh, predominantly has black and Latino gangs that, that, that do uh, the convention or the, the general gang, gang banging or gang members. There are gangs, Armenian gang members, and there are Asian gang members that live in Pasadena, but they don't do gang crime or gang things in Pasadena because these are not the cities for that. For our, our, the Armenian gang members that live there but don't do gang stuff there. They It's more in the outside of Glendale, things like that. And for the Asian gangs, more south of Pasadena, in the San Gabriel Valley, Alhambra, things like that. But they do live in the city and uh, at times will cross paths with other gang members in the cities. Again, not really uh, there's any beefs or anything like that, but just want to make note that there, there are other gang cultures that live in the city. They just don't do active gang banging in, in, in Pasadena. Um. So, so here are some of the top things that, that gangs are doing today, particularly young and youth and young adults, home invasions. That's a big deal. And, and they're getting extremely crafty at it. Uh, we see them on the news quite often. And so that's something to be in. The target there, obviously, are working people. And the other target is elderly people uh, for home invasion because they know if they come into a home, more than likely they can overpower. They feel like, let me say it that way, uh, they feel like they can overpower uh, an elderly person. Uh, and so those 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 are crimes that are up. Uh, smash and grab. You all see those on the news. Uh, I think we had one over the holiday period at, over at the Americana in, in Glendale where they ran in there and smashed up a bunch of stuff and, and ran out the store. I think a group of like 30, 40 people. Um, follow home robberies. That's a big deal. So it's important that, you know, our community members are paying attention when they're going home and checking their, and, and these are things that, believe it or not, these are crimes of opportunity that we don't really think about because you're minding your own business. You're not thinking about someone bothering you. You're going to the store, you run to the bank, you pay your bills, you're doing your regular daily routine and just, and have the same pattern and the same route that you take every single day. And most people don't tell you it's okay sometimes to change your route up or to pay attention, you know, make two more rights instead of a left when you when you do it, because people are following people and looking for opportunities that when they get in and pull in their driveway and their garages to jump out. And we see these things on the news are these crime shows, but these are real things that are happening to people. Uh, strong arm robberies, you know, tellers and walking from the store to your car and things like that. So being aware of what's out there and what the current trends are, because if that's the current trend, and then more than likely all of us is at risk for that. And this is not just for elderly people. This is for everybody. The, the target is anybody that look like they may have uh, something valuable or look like they may have something that, that's worth taking. So it's not just for elderly people. It's for anybody that, 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 that look like they fit that mold. And then social media scams. That's one that's, that's big as well. You know, and we see a lot of that in, in terms of uh, these calls or sending you emails and things like that. All of those things are, fun, are ways that young people are looking for to, to, to get large amounts of cash or valuables, you know, in, in one quick space. So that's important to, to know what the current trends are. So those are the current crime trends right now. We see one of those each and every day on the news. Um, probably at least a couple of times a week. Um, next slide, please. Let me see. Do I have any questions? I think I'm doing good. I am. All right. So how can Pasadena Village support this effort? Number one is just what you're doing now, being a, being a resource for us, being an ad advocating for us, um, sharing the information, giving us a platform to talk about what we do and, and how to connect. So resources, uh, let me say this, Pasadena Village has already, since our introduction back in December, have donated computers, uh, some gently used computers to our nonprofit arm of the organization, which is which one of my partners is that's on our team to our, our PBCG, which is Partner Building Community Groups, but that's part of our, our work in our team. So just by donating those gently used computers, that allow people to come to our office and to utilize those computers to do resumes or to search for jobs and things like that. And that's open to 
the uh, constituents that we work with, for the population that we work with. So everyone knows that they can freely come down to the office and come either sit and talk with, with someone from the team or certainly utilize the space to, to, to find jobs or to do resume building or to whatever they may need to do. Maybe it's just to get out the get out of the environment for a moment. So just donations, any type of donations. I think we were, we were giving, I don't think, I know we were giving some office equipment, uh, computers and things like that. Those things are very valuable to this team because we don't have what we call um, city space and we don't have a really a real big space for drop in. And so whatever we can get, and then we don't have a budget. Let me say that there's no budget. We don't have a monthly thing where, where, you know, people are giving us money where, we can help a lot of times our support is is from our own our own pockets so when we're taking people to job interviews uh we're using our own gas and gas money and wear and tear on our cars and things like that so any type of in-kind donation help but referrals to other organizations again i mentioned earlier when i was speaking about connections uh many of our seniors are retirement uh, uh citizens so that, that, that means you guys have put in the time and you, you, you put 20, 30, 40 years on a, in a career and, and still have those connections. Um, and that helps because maybe you can call an old supervisor. Maybe you were a supervisor or a leader and you know who your uh, successor was. And you can call that successor and say, hey, I, I, I know a person who will probably be good for this company. And would you consider hiring them if they went through the, the protocols and the steps? But understanding that they may have a couple of barriers and giving someone a chance because believe it or not, giving someone a chance changes people lives every single day. We see it quite often. So just having those type of connections to organizations and, and you maybe you know someone who uh, can help people with food insecurities. And we always have people that are hungry or housing insecurity. We're always looking for people who's looking for a place to stay. All of that helps. So Pasadena Village, uh, your community and the resources that you have even though you may not be actively working and have to punch a clock every day or have to go do certain things every day, uh, you still have uh, very important connections and valuable relationships that, uh, that you can share with the up and coming generation. So that helps. Fund development, any resources that's out there, like I said, you know, gift cards, gas cards, all of those things, you know, contact me because those things help that we give to community members. And we share that with them so that therefore we don't have to, uh, exhaust our resources, meaning our own personal budget to help, but though we will do it, it whatever it takes to help an individual out to get on their feet. And then co promote community engagement. I mean, when you hear about, you know, these type of things happening, when you hear about the gang intervention team, oftentimes, I think once a quarter, uh, we do presentations to passing the public health. I see you, Natalie. We do uh, presentations to passing the public health. Um, when that happens, you know, you you are welcome to show up and advocate and say, hey, this group is great. I'm going to stop. I think I seen a, nat a question come in from Natalie. And it says, what other gang involvement are you seeing on social media besides scams? How about gang attire? Has it changed? Since you were funded by Pasadena, what's your relationship with the Altadena Sheriff, CHP neighboring? Great question. Great question. Um, So not only are we seeing the scams, but the other thing that we often, the other thing that we see, and I can't get back. How do I get back? There we go. Uh, the other thing that we see is uh, in the chat rooms, we see uh, actively gang banging. So uh, a lot of things that, believe it or not, that we interrupt today is stuff that we learn through chat rooms. Uh, so there's a lot of gang banging, a lot of gang involvement. There's a lot of uh, threats. Uh, and all those type of things that are happening uh, in those chat rooms, uh, a lot of planning uh, where they plan to meet up or they plan to to go into each other's neighborhoods and, and to commit acts of violence. So it's not just the scams. It's a lot of active gang involvement, a lot of active gang banging, a lot of active planning to to commit crimes. So that's, what we, that's the other thing that we see. Uh, Altadena Sheriff, I have not had a chance, Natalie, to uh, meet the, the Altadena sheriffs. Uh, I used to have an awesome relationship with the sheriffs, but since I've been back in the work uh, about almost what four years now, uh, I have not had a chance to talk with anyone in the sheriffs. I would love to meet the, the captain and would love to, to get engaged in Altadena. 
Uh, I do know that there was an or- that there is an organization there that 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 works to do gang prevention and intervention. Are certainly uh, is on the the cusp of it. Is uh, my tribe rises there, I believe, um, and doing wonderful work there. Uh, so I have not been in that that area since I've been doing it in Pasadena. Gang attire. So yes, gang attire has changed. Uh, gang attire used to be baggy clothes and and uh, where they can conceal weapons and things like that or uh, wearing a predominantly one color. So if you were a part of a, a certain gang, you will wear all, all of this color or all of that color. I don't want to mention colors, but I don't do that publicly, but uh, predominantly wearing predominantly one color or particular baseball cap. So uh, that's another training. You guys got to invite me back for that because I would love to show you guys that a little bit more in detail, but the, the attire has changed a lot because if you're part of one group, because of some of the injunctions over the years and things like that, many uh, gang members have learned the law. And so they don't wear predominantly one color. Thank you, Nally. I would appreciate that. Uh, they they don't predominantly wear uh, one color anymore. And then also the baggy clothes. You know, most guys wearing skinny jeans. So I guess the the, the short answer is this. The attire has changed to look more like a civilian than to look like a gang member. Because if you were walking down the street or you were walking through a parking lot and you seen someone with a black hoodie on or a red hoodie on or a blue hoodie, whatever color hoodie, and look like they, they look like a duck and walk like a duck, you would assume it's a duck. So in order to, to take advantage of crimes of opportunity, many of these uh, those that are gang involved look like regular civilians. But obviously, you know, their behavior is, is much different. So, yes, attire has changed quite a bit from the 80s and 90s. Um, great question. That's that's a great question. Um, I think I answered the, the, the rest of it. Let me check again here. Uh, yes, you can help me. Yep, that's absolutely, Natalie. And, and please send me a text or an email. All right, next slide. I think we got one slide left or two. I think we're at meet our team. Did I, I? Okay, so this is our team. Obviously, that's me there. So I'll, I'll speak briefly about each and every one of these team members. So the guy at the bottom on the left is Mark Sutton. He shares his story publicly. And so I'm going to share his story. Uh, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of his story. Mark Sutton is a former gang member. Mark Sutton is the one of the original uh gang members of one of the oldest gangs in Pasadena. So the gang started in 1976. Uh, Mark Sutton joined the gang in 1977. And so he is one of the original that started the actual gang and started the gang behavior uh, from, I think he was around about 14, 15 years old. Um, when Mark Sutton turned 20 years old, he uh, got into a, a shooting where he retaliated. What happened is someone killed his younger brother and he retaliated. And in his retaliation, uh, he uh, a, a person was murdered and another person was injured really bad. And so Mark was sentenced to 37 years to life in prison. Uh, he did 27 consecutive years and was released on parole in 2013. He's been home. Uh, Mark called me before he came home from prison and said, hey, Ricky, I'm, I'm one of the original guys that started the game here. And I heard the work that you're doing and I want to get involved. I've changed my life around in prison. I'm no longer uh, gang banging, but I'm going to always be a gang member because that's what I committed my life to many years ago. But he comes he came home and he hit the streets running and and became active actively in the streets and community work. And so he's since then has uh been helping young people turn their life or helping their fathers and people that you know that were now older mark is now i think in his mid 50s and uh he's doing the work with our team and he's one of the original people who helped where a lot of the young people in pasadena are, are trying to be a part of he's one of the people that actually started it so that's mark sutton jose camacho he's part of our La- latino gang side jose camacho is a very good young man got engaged in gangs uh, very young. He was shot in the head and lived. And that was part of his story of changing his his life around. And so he changed his life around and had some kids and, and didn't want his kids to get involved in gangs. And so 
he wanted to be a productive citizen. So he, his kids don't travel that route. And so that's what he's doing with us. And he's very instrumental with our Latino gang population and a uh, very good young man and very humble and grateful for life. And so I'm, I'm grateful for Jose Camacho. Uh, Johnny McCrary uh, is another gentleman who, who's in the gang life. And he's actually uh, someone that Mark Sutton uh, talked to and, in, in kind of Mark Sutton's protege, per se, mentored him and Johnny turned his life around and and um, has a real heavy influence with the prison population. He's not in prison. He's on the streets, but he's been released from prison, I think now about seven years. And uh, but he keeps a strong connection because of uh, he spent 25 years, 25 consecutive years in prison uh, for his involvement in gangs. And so. Uh, he has a passion to work with that population. So when there's things happening in our city, oftentimes the, the prison population is informed and they, they kind of control certain things that happen in the neighborhood. And so uh, Johnny McCrary is that that person in between the streets and the prison who helped to make sure that we can we can do proper intervention between the two. Uh, Latoya Patillo Carr. Uh, she has she grew up in Pasadena. She grew up in 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 the gang environment. Uh, her mother was shot several times uh, uh, in, in, because she had a, a, a boyfriend who was gang involved when LaToya was very young. So LaToya witnessed violence at a young age, uh, particularly with her mother being involved. And so she grew up and, and became a person. Now LaToya, you'll see LaToya's group tomorrow uh, in the Pasadena, the annual Pasadena Black History Parade because there's a drill team that participates that marches down Fair Oaks. And Latoya coordinates those efforts and has been doing that for about 25 years now. And so she's the coordinator of those efforts. And, and so that's how she gives back. She volunteers with us right now. She's not a subcontractor uh, with me. Uh, she gives her time because she likes to work and she wanted to find a way to, to give back to young people. She also uh, works with the housing and, and food. She does everything to volunteer to help those that are in need. So every Every week she does outreach in the, at the parks and she pass out what we call our care packages, which is uh, deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrush, uh, sanitary equipment, and sometimes food. So she does that every week with, with some of the guys on the team. And then Richard Matters was not pictured there. Richard Matters is also our Latino gang specialist and he's uh, very instrumental. He's uh, uh, Jose Camacho's mentor uh, he's very instrumental as well in the prisons and the streets and and have heavy influence in the Latino gang culture uh, in Pasadena and surrounding areas. So that's our team. Uh, we're excited to, to to add folks. Of course, there's a budget there. Um, it costs a lot. Gang, let me say this. Gang intervention work is not cheap. It's, it's expensive work uh, because these folks are putting their lives on the line every single day. And believe it or not, and then, let me say this, I can tell you from my own, I don't do as much street intervention anymore as I did probably over the last 20 years. Uh, in the last five, I've utilized these people and their efforts more than, than me doing on the ground work. But over the years in doing the work, I've had guns put on me. I have knives put on me. I've been told to get out the neighborhood, get off the block. I've been asked by gang members not to do the work uh, because it was interrupting the, their, their, their funds. Uh, just recently, one of my team members was recruited and asked to to stop working with within our team, and 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 and, I, and I'll be very direct. They said that uh, this is how serious it gets. They asked my team member that whatever Ricky Pickens is paying you or subcontracting you for, uh, we're willing to to match that and more. Uh, but the level of commitment of our team member was was superb, and and he turned down that offer, and I'm very appreciative to that. But it costs money to, in order to do it. It's a public safety matter. Intervention is public safety uh, because every time that we interrupt some violence or stop a shooting, that keeps our community uh, peaceful. And so we're very grateful for the work that they do. And these folks are up all night. Uh, we have a saying, our phone never goes off. My phone will ring all times of night. And when that it rings, we are at the mercy of whatever's going on. Whether that means responding to a hospital, responding to a scene, responding to whatever is happening at the moment. There is no no turnoff period for us. Now, we do our best as we can to at times when there are these periods of peace 
to take care of our, our self-care. And I just reminded our team the other day, make sure our mental health is in place because this stuff wears on you when you see violence constantly or you're talking to people constantly in the lure of gangs and all of that stuff, it becomes aware. And I can say that and me, myself, who I've never been a gang member, although I always tell people I have the smoke of gangs on me because um, all of my family, I grew up in a gang household, but I was fortunate to escape that life. But it's a lot of pressure in it. And and, it, and and a lot comes with it. And so therefore, uh, these folks are doing a lot every single day to put themselves in, in harm's way in order to hopefully dissuade someone from, from violent behavior. And like I said, I've been in all those, a lot of mediations. I've sat at tables where we've had two smoking guns. And and when people, you know, relinquish their guns and, and, and say, you know, we don't want to continue this. So it's a lot that goes involved that a lot we can't talk about, but just know this and understand that all of us have a role to play in prevention and intervention with young people and young adults and adults in some shape, form or fashion in helping to keep our community peaceful and also helping to, to give hope to someone who found themselves in these situations. So final slide, please. Thank you, Priyanka. And so I just would like to say thank you to Pasadena Village, to you all that are attended this. And um, there's my contact information. I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but there it is. And, you know, I appreciate Pasadena Village for this opportunity. Well, thank you, Ricky. This is great. And and let me, I want to say a couple of things. One, uh, one of the benefits of, of giving this presentation for us is that you will have this presentation up on YouTube. And so it, you'll have a, a an available presentation that you can send people to and refer people to, and other people can refer to the same presentation too. So we're in hopes that that this uh, what you've done here today will have a life of its own up on YouTube, so it'll be available to a lot of people. I have, a, I have some questions too. I, I've got several questions. I'll just throw uh, several of them out and let you talk about them. And you've alluded to uh, these things in your presentation. But my questions involve jobs, uh, guns, and money, okay? And on the jobs question, I would like to hear more about uh, what your process is and how you go about finding jobs. I mean, you're talking about people who are coming in with some kind of bad history or bad record, and you got to get over the hurdle of, of convincing somebody that it's a safe thing and, and a useful thing to take the, take a risk with them and take them on board. So I'd be interested in that. The guns thing, uh, you know, we have proliferation of guns in this country. I'm listening to all the news about this Missouri shooting, and there's not much detail about motive or anything, but it sounds like some young people got uh, picked up there. So there may be some kind of gang involvement. It didn't sound like any kind of racial event as such. But the gun situation in Missouri sounds like everybody in Missouri is packing. And uh, it seems to me like in California here, we're in a different environment. I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about the, the gun situation and what how that relates to the to the gang problem. And on the money thing, uh, one thing I wonder about that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of petty crime going on in the context of the of the gang world. When somebody commits a petty crime, they get money from somebody. Is that gang money or is that their money or how's that handled? And you talk about the gang making an offer. So that is a, like a crime syndicate when they're making offers to your people to hire them. And so I just wonder about uh, about how the money is handled and the money flow in the gangs and, and what you could tell us about that. So there's a there's a, a menu you can pick and choose from there. And I, like I say, you you've re alluded to a lot of these things, but I, I just would like to hear a little bit more about them. Okay, let me start with the one I, that's fresh on the top of mind, the jobs thing. So the way that, that we do is we do an assessment uh, based on the relationship and based on the person. First of all, we don't just send people anywhere because we don't know their skill level. So we first find out their skill level. But it's also important to know if the employer is willing to do any provide any training. So if it's something that there's some training involved, then we'll know who to refer if there's no, if they're, they have to have a skill already, then we make sure that we understand that that person has that skill level. Because the, the other thing that we want to make sure that's important is that the employer is getting a gainful uh, employee, but also that 
it creates a, a open door for those coming behind this employee as well. So we want to make sure that they're not only just getting a job, but staying on a job. So we do our own assessment uh, through our relationship with the individual to find out where they are and if they're a person suitable for depending on the job. Our, the employers we meet throughout the community by having forms like this, by the construction that go on in the city. Uh, we sometimes even, you know, meet through through city people like that to find out, you know, on those projects, can we get people on those projects? So that's how we get the employment part. The guns is very, it's, it's probably about the same across the nation. I think our Pasadena Police Department is always reporting how they're recovering guns in the neighborhood. One big thing is, is that the um, being able to make these guns, because now that young people have figured out a way how to make these guns through these 3D printers, um, they're making it, their their guns. And, and quite frankly, and I'll be real honest with you, it's a real thing. Uh, my son, we bought a 3D printer for it just because I wanted to see, he was making it for some toys, but I wanted to see, can you do it? So I went on YouTube. He actually printed, actually made a physical gun. He just didn't make the, the inner workings of it because you have to make the physical shell of the gun with the printer. And then you can go on YouTube and through Amazon, you can actually buy their inner workings of the gun to put with the shell of the gun that you've actually printed on YouTube. So they call them ghost guns right now because a lot of these guns are, are not identifiable. Are, and if they're not picking up ghost guns, they're picking up guns through home invasions. They're stealing guns. And, and so, so guns are out there. Uh, for every one gun that the, the police department takes off the street, there's probably three to five more that is replaced immediately. And so that's a big problem uh, nationwide. I don't think that's just isolated to Missouri or, or here. In terms of money, so Latino gangs and Black gangs operate slightly different. Uh, Latino gangs have more of an organized structure uh, where they are uh, in some cities, in some states, they what gang members are required in the Latino population to pay what they call taxes. And so if you're part, you're claiming a gang, you have to submit an amount of money every month to uh, whoever the, the gang leader is in that area. And then they, they do that and provide and use that to provide uh, resources to their gang. Black gangs operate a little bit differently. Uh, sometimes you'll find that major influencer who uh, uh, use fear tactics or use certain tactics to influence younger gang members to do things, to go out and commit crimes and bring money back and they'll give them a percentage. So it all depends on the gang, the city, the community, you know, things like that. But some, some young people do crimes for the benefit of the gang and they will send that money, you know, to prison, people that are in prison because you have to support people in prison. Because the other thing is too, when you're in prison, you make promises and things like that, that when you get out, you're, if you got protection while you were in prison, then when you get out, you have to send money back for that protection. Because one thing you know that's promised to you within the gang structure uh, and the gang culture, I should say, is that you're promised two things. You're going to you're gonna be promised penitentiary or death if you don't get out in the right amount of time. And so they know at some point they end up in jail. And so you want to have the right protection in jail. So you want to keep your word. And so for money, that's how money works. It depends on the city, the community, the state, and, you know, if they require them to pay taxes. Jobs, that's how we do jobs. And then guns, that's that's the answer for the guns. And then I was looking on here, I see Natalie Salazar. I did not put the two and two together. I know Natalie Salazar from over 20 years ago, working with the sheriffs. Hi, Natalie, good to see you. And you look amazing. You look kind of like Benjamin Buttons, you're going backwards. You look great. <laughs> I know Natalie. I used to work with Natalie many, many, many years ago. And I, I certainly remember uh, all the interactions we had at our city meetings, even when Tony Massingale was around. So, yes, Natalie, good to see you. I just recognized the name and seen the face. I was like, is that Natalie, Natalie? That is Natalie, Natalie. Good to see you. So did I, did I get your questions, uh, Dick? Yeah, that's that's good. But, you know, it generates more questions. I start wondering, you talked about... Uh, the, the gang members paying dues. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you, I think you said uh, the gangs are much bigger than, than the gang bangers. So out of that, the 300 that you talked about where 30 of them might be the actives, how many of those kids are, are people, I should say people, the age range is a lot wider than I expect. 
but how many of those people are actually paying dues and participating at that level? And what kind of distinctions do you make among them when you're dealing with the gangs and how do you reach the, I, I assume that you're dealing mostly with the 10% who are the violent and, and uh, more active members, but what about the other 90%? How do you, how do you reach in them? And I'd like to hear more about that. So again, that's case by case. And those are intricate details that, you know, that um, how we go about doing it, I don't know if I can really say publicly, but I can tell you this, that when working with them, you, you learn who the influencers are. You learn who are the ones, uh, I guess the word that, that, that most people are familiar with is they call them shot callers or big shots. Uh, you learn who those people are and you learn what their level of influence is and what are they requiring. And, and then you try to uh, develop relationships with those that are following them. Um, with the 90%, those are the ones that we spend a lot of time on because we're hoping to dissuade the behavior from them becoming a part of the 10%. But nevertheless, sometimes they slip through the crack and they become part of the 10. Uh, but in terms of the tactics, those are the things that I rely on the team for uh, with their relationships and their background and their involvement because a lot of these are their peers. A lot of these are people that they've probably uh, spent a lot of time with either in prison or on the streets. And so I rely on them to do that uh, and whatever uh, strategies and tactics that they use to make sure that, that that we're able to intervene properly. So there is some fine line in when you're talking about this work and talking about this behavior. Um, but I will say that a lot of times our team is engaged with those that 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 do fall under those that that category. It's also interesting. Uh to hear your description of the gang culture and uh, you realize that there really is an entire social structure here with its own rules and ranks and everything else. And you mentioned something about the good qualities that you learn as a gang member and, and that's uh, loyalty and respect and so on. That's an interesting aspect that I don't hear much about is the good qualities that you learn. I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, because there's a there's a there's the thing about it is not just the loyalty. I mean, you got to think loyalty in 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 our in the civilized world translates into commitment. And so if you can be that committed to something uh, on one side of the spectrum, uh, how do we get you to translate that same level of commitment to the other side of perspective? Meaning if you can stand out on the street corner all day long and give 10, 12 hours to trying to uh, solicit drugs or sell drugs, can you give 10 or 12 hours to a, a real manageable job or career? And so that's important to show them how to translate this. Yes, this one may be fast money, but it's not loan money in the long run. And so, but you're still putting the same amount of time and hours in. You're 10 to 12 hours on the block where you can spend 10 to 12 hours where you're not worrying about the police you're not worrying about, you know, harming someone. So translate that same skill set just to the other side. So that's a lot of times that in our strategy, when we're working uh, with this population, we try to help them to translate the good qualities that comes out of that culture and translate it into civilian lifestyle versus just taking all those good skills of commitment, respect. I mean, how far does respect? I mean, I teach my sons that I have four sons and a daughter. And I teach all of my grown sons the value of respect and in, 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 in respecting people. So, you know, respect is not just something that you can, you can utilize on the gang side, but you can also utilize that same level of respect. And then they have the pecking order. You know, you respect hierarchy. Well, it's important to respect your elders. You're not, you don't want someone harming your grandmother, so why would you harm someone else's grandmother? So, you know, looking into helping them to identify you have what you need to be a productive civilized civilian versus utilizing those same skills and disrupting the community. Okay. Another thing I wonder about is the localization. Uh, you haven't really talked about uh, networks of gangs or, or where a, a local gang here in this area is like a chapter of a larger organization. Do you see that kind of structure that, that, that you're dealing with at all? Or is that something <laughs> different but yeah, so so normally in presentations, especially public presentations, now more private trainings, I'll talk in detail public stuff because, you know, you got to understand that the, the others are watching this stuff. And so I, I get scrutinized and I will get scrutinized if I 
share too much. That's just a do and don't of, of, of an interventionist. But I can say this because this is not a secret. Uh, Pasadena has one of the second largest gangs in Southern California, black gangs in Southern California. And so the city of Roses where people don't really see that, but it has the second largest black gang in, in a particular subculture. And I don't want to name the game because that's not something I do publicly. I'm sorry, Dick, about that. That's just a do and don't in this profession. Uh, but it has one of the second largest black gangs uh, out of Southern California. Uh, across the nation, it's probably in the top 10 because some of the gangs, this particular gang out of Pasadena is affiliated across the nation. They have gang members in Baltimore. They have gang members in Arkansas. They have gang members in Virginia. They have gang members in Denver, Colorado. They have gang members everywhere, and they all are associated back to Pasadena. So I can just say it that way. So, okay, so there there is a network. And I, another thing I wonder about is, to what extent are all gangs actually crime syndicates? In other words, where they're planning and operating, organizing as an organized criminal enterprise, or how many is it where, they, where it's really just kind of local gang violence among younger people? So what's, what's the breakdown or pattern there that you see? I would probably say, in my experience, probably 95 99% uh depending on the age of the gang if it's a new up-and-coming gang probably not as much but these older gangs all of them crime is involved it's organized it's stuff uh because it's been around a little while and you got to think now is uh in the society that we live in today versus the 80s and 90s you can really get a lot more organized because of the type of crimes that they're committing home invasions social media so that's, you know, those are rings. That's, you know, that's five or six people going into a house at one time. You got to sit down and think that through. Think of who's going to be driving, who's going to, you know, what are you looking for? Who's staking out? That's right. so 90, 90, 90, over 90 percent of, of these games are now organized in crime, uh, depending on, I say, age. If it's a click, because there's a difference between a click and an actual gang. And a lot of these hybrid clicks are associated to a larger part of a gang. So this is not just an issue of troubled youth. You're de you're really dealing with organizations and organized crime. Oh yeah, and trying to keep the individuals from becoming involved in that. Yeah, and that's prison and street. So a lot of times, believe it or not, uh, our intervention is we. I get prison calls. I get prison calls, and my team interact with prisoners every single day. So uh, that's. It, one of the interventions that we did last year, we were able to do that because of a prison call. And that person from prison called and made a call to some people on the streets. And that put a cease to the to the activity. So it's organized. There's there's some pecking order in some of it. And uh, it gets real intense. I can I can tell you that it gets real intense at times. Hey, Ricky, we have a question in the chat from Natalie. Uh, just how often do the field representatives from each city council district reach out to your team? And especially when gang activity flares up at the local parks here in town? When it, great question. Uh, whenever there's gang activity that flares up, I hear from all of them, most of them at least, at least District 1, 2, and 3. Um, I've talked to Tyrone Hampton, Council Member Hampton, often uh, because for a minute his his district was having an uptick in violence. So we, we talked quite a bit. And he asked about a lot of resources and what he can do to support and uh, Council Member Hampton has been extremely supportive of our work. Uh, I've talked to Council Member Jones. I've talked to Council Member, in fact, John, uh, the late great John Kennedy is not only just a great mentor of ours, but he was uh, extremely involved. We He would invite us all down to the Rose Bowl and walk with him and talk with us and strategize with us. So uh, great question, Natalie. Quite often, whenever there's an uptick in violence, when there's not an uptick, like we're experiencing kind of like this what we call our our peace time when we're having this peace time we don't talk as often but i will update them through uh the public health department or um every now and again we'll get on the phone and have a, a private phone call just to, just to, you know they'll say thank you or we'll just let them know hey you know things are good so yes we do talk to them often i also found it interesting when you were uh talking about uh, your activity 
that you're in a situation where sometimes if nothing happens, you can count that as a success. So uh, a lot of times, you know, you're out doing some good work and, and you just don't see anything going on and you just can't be sure whether you did it. But when you talk about retaliation, you got something that says, hey, this is about to happen. And if it doesn't, then you can count that as a success. So that, that's an interesting aspect of the work that you're doing is you got a, a measurable thing when nothing happens sometimes. That's the hard. Thank you. That's great that you brought that up, Dick. That's the hardest part about this work is the measurement measuring success. Mm -hmm. But and it's hard to measure success when there's nothing happening. Right. Um, exactly. But that is that is our clear indication yeah. that that we are being successful. So every single day for me, every single morning at seven o'clock in the morning, I can't wait to log up. If I haven't got a phone call the night before, I can't wait to log on to Pasadena now to find out if there's been any reported shootings, because every day that we go without a shooting, that lets me know that we're being effective, because I can tell you to really be honest, and Natalie knows this from years of this stuff. Um 80s 90s early 2000s pasadena average at least well 80s it was 30 homicides a year in terms of gangs 90s it started to reduce now i think we're down to maybe you know less than 10 and that's still too many but um here we are in what are we in february and uh we haven't had a shooting in three months we haven't had a shooting since november and so that's success for us because just because we haven't had a shooting doesn't mean we haven't had incidents. Now, that's the part where I talk about where we're working, because we've had several potential shootings that we've worked on that we know that we worked on, even quite one that was right right after Christmas, where it was going to get really crazy. And so we celebrated as a team privately because we knew what we had just interrupted. But publicly, you guys didn't get a there was no attaboy. There was no addendum. There was nothing in the newspaper to say, hey, great job. You guys stopped the shooting because nobody knew that that's what we were doing behind the scenes. That's right. Yeah. So it's immeasurable. So let me ask your opinion as a as a kind of a projection and ask you predict the future a little bit. What what can we look for? I mean, the work that you're doing uh, clearly benefits a lot of individuals because you're really changing individual lives. What is the prospect for getting rid of gangs or making making a significant change? Have you got have you worked with gangs that you've been able to break up and 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 uh, basically eliminate the gang, or are you always just kind of working around trying to do something with individuals? Ah, that's a great question. Um, we don't have the ability to break up gangs or eliminate gangs, but Gangs become inactive when the violence is reduced or there's a heavy enforcement or some of the things like Natalie used to work on back in the days with the injunctions and things like that uh, from the county level. Um, if the gang hasn't had um, the history, some of the age old history, then more than likely they become inactive. So I remember back in, in early 2000s, we were working hard. We wasn't trying to interrupt the gang, but because the gang was so young and we were getting a part of the influencers, that gang didn't last long. And it was a up and coming because a lot of the times you can see the trend because they start out as um, clicks and then the click evolves into a, a, a greater gang. And before, once they get, because what really makes it a really uh, active or, or um, authoritative gang is the numbers. The more numbers you got, the more power you have. And so when we can enter, engage them and interrupt some of that violence and interrupt some of the behavior of some of the females or males in there, it reduces the activity, which in turns they either become a part of the larger gang and no longer be, try to become that spinoff anymore, or, or it just dismantles, period. So we've been, we've been, I've been a part of those um, processes over the years, but I, I couldn't take credit and say I've dismantled a gang. I've just been instrumental in helping uh, people to to uh, get out of the lifestyle, which more than likely because they were the influencer, uh, it helped reduce the activity of of that particular gang. So I can't take that that kind of credit. That's a that's a huge that's a huge uh, check mark for me. But I I wouldn't do that. That those guys will start calling me if they ever seen this stuff. <laughs> but uh, but in terms of trends, um, I don't think I think with the way uh, social media 
in in some of the cultures that's out there in the music industry uh in communities as long as we have the social disparities that we have we're always going to have some type of uh negative aspect to, to to gangs and 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 it's all about you know what what law enforcement defines as as a gang is is obviously what makes it negative is the criminal activity uh you always going to have social clubs and different things out there like that uh that even i mean you listen to the game the first thing a game member would do is call a police police gangs uh we've heard activists say that kind of stuff um but in terms of the this type of gang membership i think that as long as there are these uh inequities in our society and lack of opportunities, I think we're always going to have some type of social group that will participate in negative behavior in order to uh, even the playing field. Well, that's very interesting. I when I I moved out here in 2018 from Houston and I moved into Highland Park in Los Angeles, and and looking into that neighborhood, I understood that they had uh, in the past. Uh, probably 15 or 20 years before it had been a really a, a serious gang problem in that area. And the story, as I heard it, was that they had basically arrested most of the, uh, the, the more violent parts of the gangs and put them away. And that, and so the gang violence subsided and Highland Park started becoming gentrified and real estate values going up and everything. And then somebody told me a lot of those guys are getting out of jail now. 15 20 years later and they're coming back and they're going back to some kind of gang life now i don't know of any signs of it or anything like that but i th i thought this was an interesting thing to hear about the place where i lived i wonder if you had any comment on that or yep yep so pasadena has the same same type of uh uh thing of course uh gangs in pasadena here's the thing these these generations take ownership of these cities, these parks, these locations. And so as one generation comes, that's why we have what we call uh, uh, the cyclical or the cycle of violence, because one generation, you know, ages out or moves out and the next generation comes in. Uh, believe it or not, um, Pasadena is experiencing that type of gentrification and that type of uh, uh, behavior that you that you described in Highland Park. But you're always, they don't move too far away from the city that they can't participate in the activity of the city. So uh, we find ourselves in our intervention efforts that a lot of times we're, we're preventing or intervening in things from coming in the city because many of uh, those that are participating in that lifestyle don't live in the city, but they come every weekend to part because that's, that's the familiarity, that's the safe zone. You, if you live out of the city, you're not going to show that you're a rival game member living in the city. You're going to come home in order to to be in your safe zone. You're going to participate in your gang involvement in the neighborhood where you're from. So in, in essence, Pasadena somewhat has the same issue right now with gentrification in terms of people moving out. I mean, our parks don't look the same. Our neighborhoods don't look. I grew up in Kings Villages. I grew up in nearby community arms. I literally grew up in those areas. Uh, uh, those areas was heavily populated by African American and Latinos. Then I was there in the city, you know, a month ago, and 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 I seen Asian families walking dogs and things like that throughout the neighborhood. You would have never seen that in the eighties, and I'm not saying that as a disparaging or some uh, in a racial tone. I'm saying that it's it's nice to see diversity, but you would have never seen that when right, I was growing right. up as a little boy. Yeah. Well, this is interesting. I have to say I'm suffering a little information overload here. You give us a lot of information, a lot of things to think about. So uh, I think it's been a wonderful presentation. Anybody else got questions? Lyle or Priyanka, got anything showing up there? Nothing else in the chat as of now. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I don't know, Ricky, if you got any final comments uh, that you'd like to make before we shut her down. Anything else I'll, you'd like to tell us? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to say thank you again, and I'd like to tell you that I really appreciate. Uh, you guys had a lot of good detailed stuff. I, you know, I would hope that you would consider either some type of gang workshop. Uh, maybe even, I don't know if you guys do anything in person. I, mean, I don't know where everyone lives at. Uh, and, and if so, if we were to do it, um, it'd have to be a private group. But I like that you guys are 
your light bulbs come on, you want to know more. Uh, in public settings like this, I can't give details and intricacies, uh, but in private settings, I can get a little bit more detailed and, 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 and answer questions in a more um, detailed way and with a little bit more information. So if you're interested in that, just reach back out and we can set up something like that. But in this public space, I certainly appreciate this opportunity. I certainly appreciate this forming a partnership with you all and, um, you know, find a way, some kind of way of all the things that I've shared, you know, find out where you fit in in that, if you fit in and just contact me directly. And, uh, and I'll love to, to, to help or I certainly love to come alongside you and, and find a way to, to help this population. Uh, Cause each person that each one teach one, each person that we help to uh, redirect their life and get in a better way. That's one less person we got, you know, disrupting society. Well, that's so great. Thank you. All right. Thank well, great. So well, thank much. you very much. Yep. Go ahead, Priyanka. I was just thanking Ricky for all of this. I, I didn't know probably a tenth of this information. So I'm uh, grateful that we you took the time to present to us. That's great. And, uh, you know, like I said, we this is recorded and the presentation will be available up on our YouTube channel sometime next week, as soon as we can get it up. And I will send out an announcement to our mailing list. So everybody on our mailing list will know when it's available and you can tell your friends about it and promote it and uh, spread the word. So more and more people learn about this. It's very interesting information to learn about where we live and what's happening here. So thank you very much, Ricky, and thanks to everyone for coming. And